courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Here we are, and it's the end of June, and we are back for another Fireside Chat. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, how's your summer going? Oh, it's been busy doing a lot of yard work. With the Flames not making the playoffs, I've had a lot of spare time. Did you watch much playoff hockey? Uh, Just the finals. Uh, Because I didn't really like a lot of the teams that were playing on the way to the finals. So, yeah. And and what are your thoughts on uh, Vegas making it all the way? Well, back before the season started, I thought that Winnipeg would play Calgary in the Western final. Because I thought that the Pacific teams kind of sucked. And especially the California teams, I didn't think that they had it in them. So Vegas took our spot. And I didn't think that... uh, uh, Winnipeg would lose to Vegas, but that happens, and Vegas was not clearly inferior to the Capitals, and I'm glad to see Ovechkin winning the Cup, and I think he's still partying now, and I think he probably will be into August. He can party in two languages. Yep. All right, well, we have a lot of Flames news to talk about as we lead up. We're less than a week away from the opening of free agency on July 1st, so... Why don't we jump right in and let's do this? Well, I have to also congratulate Taylor Hall for getting out of Edmonton. Oh, and winning the Hart Trophy. Yeah, that was uh, that was the end of the Edmonton curse, right? Yep. And good for him because you know proving them wrong, which you know it's Edmonton. Well, the first thing the Flames did this offseason was they signed a new head coach. And you and I talked a lot about that during the season. We all knew Gully was going. It was just a matter of who was going to replace him. And your sort of front runner was, at the time, Daryl Sutter, who's now retired from the NHL. But the Flames ended up with three new coaches. They signed head coach Bill Peters, an Alberta boy from Three Hills, who was previously coached in Carolina, now our head coach. They brought in Jeff Ward, who's a former assistant coach in New Jersey. He's the associate coach for logistical reasons that aren't worth getting into. And Ryan Huska, the head coach of uh, the AHL, what are they now, the Stockton Heat. I always forget who our farm team is. We move it so much. Yeah. Um, he is now the assistant. Uh, it looks like Huska will be responsible for the, po- the penalty kill and the uh, defenseman. And Ward will be running the power play and the forwards during the game. So, Matt, thoughts on this new team? Well, I like the fact that they got Bill Peters. Um, I, like, I wanted somebody, when I mentioned getting Sutter, that would be confrontational to the players and not just a easygoing, nice guy. And Glenn Gullitson, he's a decent tactician, but the personnel issues just it's not his game and they needed somebody to come in and kick the players in the butt and i think peters will do that very much the same style of coach in terms of personality as sutter so that is basically what i was looking for it it's one of those things that you can't always get the exact person that you're wanting but if you're getting that archetype of player player or coach that's the important thing and peters i think will do as effective of a job as sutter would have because the main issue is to get the players on the same page and motivated and i don't think they were under gullitson so hopefully he can whip them into shape and one of the things you mentioned during this season was the way that Sutter's coaching staff was made up. You'd mentioned how, you know, they had Sutter there to sort of be the heavy. They had Rich Preston there to go tell some of the jokes, um, you know, and loosen the players up. I think that if we look at this team, adding in Jelena and Siglet, I think you're going to see a lot of the same makeup. I think, like you said, Bill Peters is not a player's coach necessarily. He's, you know, I don't want to say he's going to yell and scream. He's not Tortorella, but... I think he's here to get business done and he doesn't really care if the guys like him or not. Yeah. Um, I think Jeff Ward is going to be very similar. And I think Ryan Huska might be the players coach out of all these guys. I like the acquisition of Ward, especially Uh, New Jersey's penalty or power play was excellent. And they did some innovative things with their power play. And he was the type of guy. I was hoping that the flames, would emulate uh 
system wise for the power play at this upcoming season so going and snagging him from new jersey hey perfect so, you know get the guy who designed the system jeff ward played in the nhl he actually had his name engraved on the cup with the bruins in 2012 he was uh, his, wasn't that aaron ward or sorry 2011 jeff ward 2012 i think was aaron ward but no according to the hockey hall of fame site jeff ward's on in 2011 okay um Jeff Ward was in uh, New Jersey with the Devils as their assistant coach. The rule that they made was he could only end up talking to another team if he got promoted. So he got promoted from assistant coach to associate coach for whatever that means, just so the Flames could sign him. So I wouldn't put It's basically the head of the assistant coaches. So there's two of them. So you flip the coin as to who's the head. Yeah. And then interesting note. I think it usually means that they get paid more than like your standard assistant coach. So probably if you're the head of something, you should get paid more for it. Yeah. Um, another interesting note on our other coach, Ryan Huska. I think this is a great move because Huska has worked in our AHL team for a number of years now, and he knows all the young players. So as these guys come up, he's going to be able to work with them and know their tendencies. But he played only one NHL game that was with the Blackhawks against the Calgary Flames, where he played five fifty-one and eight shifts. So. He uh, he played against the Flames, and now he's coaching in the NHL for the Flames. Yeah, and he's a very good coach for defensemen, and te- especially teaching defensemen. And with the acquisition of Hannafin and guys like Anderson, Chillington, and Kulak, and Valamaki coming up, that that uh, that will be important at, for them to be able to get those players to transition into the NHL. And just as a note, because. Uh, Huska did get did get promoted. They needed to find a new coach for Stockton, so they went with a guy who used to coach the Flames ECHL affiliate when they were in Adirondack. That's before they became an AHL affiliate in Adirondack. Uh, he's been the assistant coach in Stockton since, and that's Kale McLean. And he's uh, thought a, to be a rising star, fairly coach. well regarded coach. He was the defensive yep. coach in Stockton last year, so I think this is probably a good move for the Flames. Yep. And I won't read out the list of teams he's played for. Most of them never heard of, like the Cleveland Lumberjacks. And uh, Well, isn't that everybody's favorite team? The Cleveland Lumberjacks, the Cincinnati Mighty Ducks, the Indianapolis Ice, the Michigan K-Wings, the Lowell Lock Monsters, the Philadelphia Phantoms, Grand Rapids Griffiths, Pro- Providence Bruins, Hartford Wolfpack, Hershey Bears, Bridgeport Sound Tigers. So he knows the AHL very well. Yeah. Um, and the scary thing is, is I've actually heard of every single one of those before. But yeah. So, guy who's probably going to be good down there, I think, again, the fact that he was an assistant getting promoted, he knows the players already, and that's going to help with some of that transition. Yep. And then, I don't know if we should gloat over this or what we should do, but uh, our former head coach already signed to Glenn, Glenn Gullitson. Didn't waste too much time to get another job. He's now going up north, not being exiled to Siberia, but going to Edmonton, where he's signed on as an assistant coach. That is what i think gullitson will excel at he's a great assistant yeah i just i don't see him ever coaching as a head coach in the nhl again um i'd be shocked frankly if anybody did but he shouldn't be too bad as an assistant coach and like tactically he's not bad and if he's kept on a leash with a certain directive of we want this done He's perfectly fine. It's just getting him to handle all the personalities does not work for him. I think he's very similar to a guy like uh, Jim Playfair. We He was a rising coach in the AHL. We brought him in, tried him as a head coach, found out he didn't work. But he's been working with Phoenix now for a number of years, their associate coach. I think Playfair is a guy who, again, will have the rest of his career as a assistant coach, which you know is perfectly valid. Um, he's been there since 2011. I think that's going to be Gullitson as well. I think he'll be a highly sought after assistant. Yeah. Well, Matt, anything else on the coaching front you want to chat about? No, just looking forward to the training camp to see what tweaks they'll make to the system and all that kind of fun stuff. So that way we can have something more to discuss about that. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the ideas that the new coach may or may not have through this episode and as we move through the off season, but why don't we jump to the NHL draft 
Um, you and I didn't know what to do with ourselves. We usually do a pre-draft episode talking about the players of Flames oh, yeah. we pick. And plenty of articles and the whole nine yards, but when you don't pick in the top 100, it's like, um, who are these people? And so, it's one of those situations that it, there was no way we could accurately cover it. We'd basically just say, hey, take the upside, guys. And that's exactly what the Flames did. So, yeah, it, there's not... Yeah, carry on. So let's break these picks down. If anyone wants to see some of these players, we'll talk more about it at the end of the show. But uh, schedule in the rookie development camp this summer on your schedule. You'll probably see most of these guys there as the Flames like to bring them all in to work out in July. So the first pick the Flames made at number 105, which is uh, their fourth round pick. This was one of their many fourth round picks in this round was Martin Pospil. Uh, he's an 18-year-old from Slovakia. He's six foot two, 172 pounds. Shoots left, plays right wing. Um, not a lot's known about this guy. He has committed to St. Lawrence University in the NCAA next year, which is a smaller city. Played for the Sioux City Musketeers of the USHL last year and got 37 points. He's a he. Reminds me of uh, a couple of our picks from last year. If you combine the two guys and that's adam rujitska and um oh what's the other guy the fifth round pick guy not jolie no ah uh, jeez. i have to look it up hold on yeah um but why does he remind you of those guys what are the uh, aspects there's a lot of tools available like he has offensive skill and he's a big rangy center slash winger but he's also mentally unhinged. <laughs> Zach Fisher was our fifth round pick. Zach Fisher, year. that's the guy. And like he had something like 257 penalty minutes and was just a completely reckless player. And that if they can control his aggression and direct it in the proper manner, you know, like hitting people without taking penalties, that kind of stuff then he could end up being a good player, but it's one of those, you don't know exactly how this player will turn out. And sometimes that just shows a lack of discipline and a lack of hockey sense as well, and there's sometimes nothing you can do about that. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations that you just have to try to teach them the right way of doing it and hope that they learn, and... There's enough offense there where, like, if he was not taking as many penalties, then he would have had more points because, you know, it's kind of hard to score from the penalty box. So it, it's it, – there's more there than what you would expect for a player with that kind of point range. It's just that he's probably going to end up be a four-year NCAA guy and then see at the end of that whether it's worth giving him a contract. Which might be fine. I mean, he's got some things to work on for sure and giving him four years. It also buys us some time to find out if he's going to fit in our system or not. Yeah, it, think of it like Tim Harrison, but with more upside. And he has some actual legitimate offensive skill, whether he can focus that into positives we'll see so you were mentioning his penalty minutes so his stats last year in the ushl which is for those that don't know it's sort of like the uh, u.s version of the whl it's all younger guys mostly high school age right through kind of 20 um not as competitive as the chl by a lot of accounts but he played 49 games eight goals 29 assists for 37 total points and he had 253 penalty minutes yeah and he also, if I recall correctly, didn't have a point in his first, like, 10 games. So uh, that's also a little deceptive. It doesn't sound like a lot, but of his 49 games, he spent just over four full games in the penalty box. Yeah, so uh, a little bit of discipline issues. <laughs> the next guy the Flames picked was their pick at number 108, just a few picks later. I am still don't remember who's picks came from who and what trades, but we'll let our listeners sort that out if they want to. I think uh, this one's the Hoodler pick. Wow. There's a name yeah. I didn't even think of. Yeah. Um, and this is a player with a Greek name, Demetrios Kumantzis. Kumantzis? 
Um, we'll find out the pronunciation when we get the official media guide from the Flames on this one. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be like well, the, the Mangiapani well, of this year where everybody says it differently. Yeah, well, it, it's difficult when you've got a bunch of European names and from all sorts of different countries and none of them are necessarily pronounced the way they look. So We'll try to ask Shillington Demetrius how, how he wants his name pronounced when we talk to him at the training camp. Uh, he's an 18-year-old from Minnesota, Adena, Minnesota. He's 5'10", 183 pounds, shoots left, and plays left wing primarily. He had an interesting 2017-18 season where he played for three different teams. He played mostly for Adena High School in the Minnesota High School Division, which is a pretty competitive high school uh, league. He played 24 games, got 20 goals, 21 assists, 41 points. This guy has a penalty minute count that's reasonable, 23 penalty minutes. Uh, he hey, also- that's virtually a Lady Bing winner there. There you go. To the last guy. <laughs> and then he played for Team Northeast, which I think is a, like a selects tournament. Uh, and he played 21 games there, got 16 goals, 33 assists for 49 points, and played one game with the Green Bay Gamblers, got no points. He's committed to Arizona State University next year. So, again, there's a guy that the Flames will retain his rights for four years going into the NCAA. Matt, what do you know about Demetrius? He's another one of those skilled short players. And it's one of those hey it's worked with Gaudreau and Manjapani so why not try going to that well again it doesn't hurt if they do figure it out then you've got a guy with at least some offensive upside and where if you take just you know your random six foot guy if they figure it out you're you've likely got a fourth liner so you know it's always better to take a guy that if he pans out, you got a second, third line talent instead of a filler guy. The next player on the list is the only one in this whole draft class for the Flames who can actually go on the roller coaster at the amusement park. Uh, Milos, Milos Roman plays for the Vancouver Giants of the WHL. He's 18, six foot, 196 pounds. Again, shoots left and plays center. He's from Slovakia as well. Uh, in his year with the with the Vancouver Giants, he played 39 games, got 10 goals, 22 assists for 32 total points, 10 penalty minutes. He also played for Slovakia in the World Juniors, where he picked up two goals. This is a pick that the Flames didn't come into the draft actually having. They traded their fourth-round selection next year to Montreal in exchange for this pick, so they obviously were quite high on Roman to, to go and trade for that pick. Yeah, and from what I've seen of him, he reminds me a little bit of Dylan Dubé, uh, a less skilled version overall, uh, but it, just a solid all-around player, and if he pans out, you've got a decent two-way player. Uh, like, I wouldn't expect more than 30 points in an NHL season from him if he makes it. I think you'd to- be lucky to get this guy past your bottom six. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, if he pans out to the upper end, you, you're looking at a third, fourth line guy. Unle- but you know, uh, unless you're Edmonton, you wouldn't even want this guy in your top six. Yeah, sure. Like he's just—I don't think he's got a. From what I've seen, his play isn't dynamic enough for that. Yeah. So that was the end of the Flames' fourth round. They were busy there. Then they waited uh, until the sixth round to make their next selection. They didn't have a fifth-round pick. I think this is probably the least number of picks the Flames have made in a single draft. Uh, no, they've had uh, five before a couple of times. Uh, the, the year they got Furland, that they had five picks. So The next pick was the 167th pick, which is their sixth-round pick, and this was a universe... They picked... Um, from Norway, he played for the Muskegon Lumberjacks of the USHL. Matthias Emilio Pedersen, he's 18. YouTube star. That's right, yeah, you can see a lot of this guy on YouTube. Yeah, from when he was six years old forward, you can see him quite thoroughly. The most scouted of all Flames prospects ever. <laughs> and they probably didn't even need to leave their coach to go watch him. No. This is the kind of scouting gig you I want, Matt. Yeah. Um, he, Just sit on the couch and watch some stuff on the computer, and there you go. That's right. File your report, and you're done. Yeah. Uh, he's 5'10", 170 pounds. Again, a left-shot centerman. 
As mentioned, he played for the Muskegon Lumberjacks of the USHL. A lot of USHL guys for the Flames, but that's what happens when you go deep in your drafts. 60 games played, 14 goals, 32 assists for 46 total points. And next year he's committed to the University of Denver in the NCAA. So, again, a guy the Flames will have four years of rights on. What do you know about yeah, Matthias? Skilled player, and that's about it. Like He's another short, skilled player, just in the same mold as Manjapani, Phillips, uh, Kuzmansis. It Just, you know, you, you might as well take a risk. Because with skill, you can't teach that. And if they figure it out the rest of their game, then you've got a dynamic player. And if they don't, then, oh, well, you've got somebody that can at least be an offensive catalyst in the AHL at the minimum. So either way, it doesn't hurt. And, you know, like we've seen other teams capitalize on picks like this, like Andre Palat in Tampa or um, Jake Gensel with Pittsburgh. So it, Every once in a while, one of them does turn out, and when you don't have a first, second, or third round pick, you might as well take a, a chance, at least, at the lottery to that one of these guys will pan out to be something worth a first or second round pick. We'll talk about the last guy here, um, but even on that note, I mean... People often forget that you even need great AHL players to help with the development of your young guys. And there's guys whose whole job it is to stay in the AHL and help develop your young guys. And I think from this draft class, that's probably where most of these guys are going to end up as, you know, yeah. career AHLers. Yeah, like, honestly, I would be somewhat surprised if any of these players played 100 games in the NHL. Yeah, uh, it, it, It's about 15% of picks from the third round on doesn't matter which round make the nhl for 100 games so uh, odds are one might but uh, you know it's unlikely with any of these guys but if they do the flames have taken players that if they do pan out they will be good well, at the very minimum let's talk about the last pick in this draft the 198th pick it's weird to see the 17-year-olds in this draft as the players who were born in in 2000. That's just weird to me. But uh, this is Dimitri. You're old, Dan. I am. You're but old. It's just it's weird seeing the birth year zero zero. At first, I'm like, is this an error? Oh, he was born in 2000. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Dimitri Zavgardenu is the Flames' seventh round pick, number 198. He's he's 17 from Russia. He's five foot nine, 174 pounds, shoots right, plays center and right wing. He played for Ramuski in the QMJHL this year, 62 games, 26 goals, 21 assists, 47 total points, and also went to the playoffs and got three points there. He played for Russia in the U18 team, uh, where he got five games, one goal. I've seen some footage of this kid. I think it's, as you mentioned earlier, a good depth pick, but... I don't expect this guy to ever get close to the NHL. No, I, there was a tournament, I think the Holinka tournament, uh, where he performed well, and I think that's where he made a bit of a name for himself and then really didn't do much after that. Um, if I recall correctly, there was talk of him being a potential second-round pick, but uh, with his not progressing at all, uh, he obviously fell to the seventh. If, Probably the Russian factor as well. Yeah, it's one of those things where you see if there's more there, there, then hey, great. If not, okay. This, it's a seventh round pick. This is going to be weird because some Flames fans won't know who I'm talking about. From the footage I've seen of this guy, he reminds me of another Flames Russian prospect we never saw, which was Andre Teratukin. Yep, I agree. Justin That's the exact player I was thinking of. Just in the way he plays, what I think the upside is, he just he reminds me. I remember I was really high on Teratukin when we drafted him, and these guys Same have here. A, I, and there I was think, flashes there. Yeah, there's flashes there where you think, oh, this guy might be something, but it, that's all it is, is the flash here and there, and then that's it. And, yeah. Well, the Which is quite annoying, because, you know, you wish that those players would actually translate. Yeah, but, but, you know, at the same time, if you have a guy like that in the first or second round, they don't translate as a fan, you're upset. If you draft him in the seventh round, you never expect them to be anything. Yep, exactly. It's more like found money if they actually do 
turn into anything that's useful. Well, with the Flames not having a lot of picks, I think Tree was getting bored on the draft floor and decided that he should go out and make a splash. So people actually talked about the Flames, and they made a big deal. I would say probably the biggest hockey deal Tree Living has made is the GM of this flame uh, Flames team. What do you think? Well, I think that he made out like bandits. I really, really like this trade. I liked it right from the second it was announced. Well, let's go through and the trade first. as more details came out, I like it even more. So this trade, uh, the Calgary Flames gave up Dougie Hamilton, Michael Furland, and prospect Adam Fox, shipped them all to Carolina in exchange for Noah Hannafin and Elias Lindholm. And Matt, I totally agree with you. I'm one of the few people I've talked to who likes this deal. Um... For those that say why the Flames give up Fox, Tree hinted at it. Fox had no intention, it sounds like, to sign in Calgary. So you got to get rid of him. And it's one of those things that uh, when you and I talked to him, I asked him about like what his thoughts were with the Flames having as much prospect depth uh, on defense and so many young defensemen. And he gave a weird look that like he was kind of annoyed that he had that much competition for the spot. And the road to the NHL would be harder accordingly. And I think that uh, to me, it stood out that I think this guy might not want to be here. That was just my impression. And you know, you just wait and see it because you know, you don't. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad we moved him early in some. Yeah, exactly. It's unlike Tim Erickson where it's like, crap, we we're going to lose this guy next week. Quick, make a deal and get whatever we can. for. Yeah, exactly. And at least the flames managed to get, uh, th- this honestly is a great trade, and so let, let's look at the two players coming in, if you don't mind. Yeah, and you have Noah ha- Noah Hannafin, uh, who's a uh, similarly tall uh, defenseman to Dougie Hamilton. Uh, six, both of their six foot five, and both are va- very fast skaters. Both have good shots. Both are offensive defensemen. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. Hannafin's 21 years old. Dougie Hamilton's 25. So for people that I've heard this year, this week comparing the two guys, I say you have to compare a 21-year-old Dougie Hamilton to a 21-year-old Noah Hannafin. It's not fair to compare a guy who's four years higher in his development. Yeah, exactly. And like if you look at players who have... Uh, I'm actually going to use a Corsi argument in this one. Um for defensemen in the NHL to have more than 30 points and a Corsi rating over 55%, there's only four defensemen at the age of 21 in the NHL currently who've had that. Hannafin, Dougie Hamilton, uh, Eric Carlson, and Alex Petrangelo. So you're dealing with a very top-notch defensive player as well. And it's a good thing for the flames because of the fact that you have four more years of him in a flames Jersey than you would just with Dougie Hamilton. The year that, uh, that Hannafin got acquired was the 2015 draft, a fairly, uh, well scouted draft. That was actually the year we gave up our pick, um, which was supposed to be, which was in the Dougie Hamilton deal. We didn't pick till the second round that year, but, I really liked Hannafin that year. I hope that if he fell to the Flames, they would have picked him. Oh, same I, here. I think, for those that don't know, here's a good summary I found of Ham, of uh, Hannafin. He's a dynamic two-way defenseman who has no holes in his game. An exceptionally strong skater who isn't afraid to take the puck himself and move it up the ice. The confidence he has in his abilities lets him thrive under heightened competitive levels. The skilled defenseman's undeniable high level of hockey sense and showcased whenever he touches the puck in the offensive zone. Defensively, he's aggressive, consistently pushing for puck possession and a quick transition to offense, but in the same steadfast, reliable, and patient manner. He's poised beyond his years and mature in his decision-making. All in all, Noah Hannafin's the ideal all-around defenseman who leaves no areas of his game untended. And that's from Curtis Joe of Elite Prospects. I think that's a great description of this kid. I th- yeah, I think it's we're- one of those things that like some people are like, oh well, he makes defensive mistakes. He's twenty one at, at times, exactly. And like, give me a break. Like, uh, Dougie Hamilton makes defensive mistakes all the time. Like, you know, give the kid some time at least to see if he can improve on that. But you know, like if you look at Giordano or Brody or any of the younger defensemen like even guys from flames history like gary Souter and al mckinnis like they were bad defensively at that age so 
you know, it takes time. And but then they figure it out. So I think if we project out for their careers, I don't know about you. I think Hannafin, maybe we're getting a little bit of a, a downgrade this year, but I think Hannafin's gonna turn out to be the better defenseman in the long term. Honestly, I, I think that Hamilton and Hannafin next year will basically be the same guy. And like I don't see their point totals being more than like five or six apart. And you know, I don't see there being that much of a gulf between their overall play. So we'll see. And he'll be coming into a situation where he has a very reliable defensive defenseman as his partner in Hamannick. And Giordano and Brody are getting reunited, so that's good. And we'll see. Uh, but for me, like that, you're basically trading a 25 year old for a 21 year old of the same guy basically like at the worst like if Hannafin doesn't improve defensively he will be Dougie Hamilton if Hannafin improves defensively you've upgraded on your already very good defenseman and his age is more in keeping with the young guys like Kachuk like Bennett like Jankowski where Hamilton was on the upper end of that era of player. Well, and you and I both saw Hamilton as sort of the next great defenseman here. I think we both said when he was acquired that when Gio retires, he's going to be the, you know, the number one guy here. And I think even more so with Hannafin, is that true? He's 21. He's a young yeah. player. I think he's got amazing potential. And I think coming to a team with Bill Peters, remember Peters coached in Carolina where these players are coming from. Peters already knows how to work with this guy. And I think that's going to really help his development as well. Yeah, and you also have to look at the fact that like the Flames have Anderson, Chillington, and Valimaki all in that same age group. I think they're all basically within like a year of each other, all four of those guys. So if those guys do eventually make the NHL, then you've got a solid quartet of players that are all the same age. And that's very useful, especially like moving forward in when they're like 26, 27, 28. To have them all basically being together as a group for a long time. Well, let's talk about the other piece the Flames get. This is, uh, oh, before we do, Hannafin is worn number five in Carolina. Matt and I were expecting to probably double that and we're 55 here with the Flames. Yeah. The next guy that the Flames brought in is a center and right winger who shoots right. Elias Lindholm, 23-year-old Swede. Um, he's six foot, 192 pounds. Last year in Carolina, he played 81 games, got 16 goals, 20 assists for 44 total points. I think this is a big upgrade over Furland. I don't know what you think. Oh, give me a break. This is a home run. Uh, if you like Mike, Michael Backlund, think of him at that age with more offensive skill, and that's what you have in the last You sound like a hockey goal. search He's... engine. If you like Michael Backlund, you might also like Elias Lindholm. Yes, exactly. You know, also, similar related players, and <laughs> Michael Frolik. And it's funny you mentioned back then. We'll talk about my line combinations as they sit now, but I think Backlund and Lindholm are going to play together on line two. I don't, but anyhow, we'll get to that later. Um, I think that Lindholm is a very responsible two-way player. He's a little inconsistent offensively. Like I think he went like 27 games without a goal last year. Uh, struggled down the stretch much like Furland did, but... Uh, he is a very offensively skilled player, and you also have to look at those numbers in context because, frankly, Carolina's forwards suck outside of Skinner and Aho. So, you know, like they and like Skinner and Aho aren't even anybody to write home about anyway. Like, they're decent second line players on most teams, not like superstar caliber guys. So, like, if he's playing with Kachuk or with Gaudreau and Monaghan, like, his numbers should go up just because he's playing with better players. Well, I mean, even look at Furland, right? In 2016-2017, he got 25 points. 2018-2019, or 2017-2018 last season, he played the whole season pretty much on the first line, almost doubled that to 41. Yeah, exactly, and... The problem, like a lot of people like Furland, I like Furland, uh, it, it's just that he's a free agent next year. Uh, you unrestricted free agent at that. And if he gets, say, 40 points again, 
do you want to lock him up for five years at four million dollars a season i don't like he's just not worth that and that's the problem and so you're basically left with walking away from the asset entirely and not getting anything for him and or moving like, him to the sucks. deadline yeah, and it sucks because you know I w did not want Furlan to leave. Like it, it, there would have been a role in this team for him. It's just what do you do? You know, you have an asset that you're gonna get basically nothing for him, or a a mid round draft pick or something at the deadline, and that's it. Like <sighs> we, we all fell in love uh, with Furlan in the what was it, the 2015 run against the Canucks when he was yeah right there. and we he we, basically won that series by and himself. we always fall in love with the tough guys I mean McGratton we all loved right look back at the tough guys throughout this team Ronnie Stern Rocky Thompson you know we always liked that tough guy and yeah I think we maybe we all like Furlan and that's why we feel bad that he's leaving but if you look at him on paper. He's an expendable player. I mean, yeah, there's room for him, but I think there's a lot of other guys that could fill the yeah. role that he would take. I don't think he'll be... A f You've heard me say all season, I don't think he's your first-line right winger on a playoff team. So I think that... No, he's a third- or fourth-line player in every aspect of his game other than a slap shot, which is a dynamite thing. And like that's part of the reason why he was put on the first line in the first place is because his shot is just that good. It's just that the the rest of his game is just okay and it's not worth to spend the money that you'd need to keep him for a shot and if I, for the rest of and his if game. i look at where i project the roster to be i think he'd end up on the fourth line and i think uh, same you know, this is probably better for him to get him out of here and let him go play somewhere else and i mean he got 44 points playing with a strong first line or sorry 41 last year uh lindholm got 44 playing on a not so good line in carolina I think as long as Lindholm and Hannafin keep developing, Calgary wins this trade. Easily. And Fox is a good prospect, and he will probably make the NHL and probably will be a decent top-ish, like four-ish defenseman. But he didn't want to be here. And, you know, you're looking at a Jimmy Vesey situation where, like, if the Flames waited, they might get a fourth-round pick for him, which, yay, whoopee-doo. Uh, you know, it, so at least they were able to include him in this deal to get two high quality assets. Cause like the way I look at it is were Furland and Fox core players in this team? No, of course not. And Hamilton was, but now Hannafin and Lindholm are, and you have two more good pieces to build around. And I'm expecting that when their contracts get signed, that they'll both be of the long-term variety of the six, seven-year-ish range. And th these guys will be Flames for a long time. You know, I think the best comparison for if we kept Fox would be Tim Erickson. Yeah, exactly. And and, and if we look back at that, he was a 20 th 23rd overall pick by the Flames. They traded him because he didn't want to be here to New York. And in the in return, the Flames got Roman Horak, Marcus Granlin, Tyler Watherspoon. So if you wait, you're going to get a bunch of sort of tweener guys. Yeah. And at least this, you got two impact players that will immediately improve your team. And I think the difference between Hamilton and Hannafin is going to be largely overblown because as Hannafin progresses as a player, he's going to get better and where Hamilton doesn't really have anywhere to go uh, in terms of a northward direction. So we'll see. I don't want to comment on too much because we don't have any knowledge, but tree living hinted that he wants guys who want to be in Calgary. There was some, rumors that maybe Hamilton wasn't the best guy in the room. I mean, it is weird that you've been to three teams by the time you're 25. There were some rumors when we got him that he wasn't the best guy in the room in Buffalo. Boston, um, yeah. Or sorry, Boston, yeah, when he was with the Bruins when we picked him up. Um, I just, I, I think that maybe this is one of those situations where there was some outside factors where Hamilton just had to go. And I think that if that's the case, if nothing else, yeah, maybe... Maybe we don't have as good a player this year, but it might improve the overall team culture, which there's a lot to be said for as well. It's one of those situations that, because like I have no personal clue on any of it, 
you know, like I've heard like the reports of, oh, he likes to go to museums. And like, frankly, if I was traveling with the team, I'd like to go to museums too. So, you know, like it, well, there's even the thing here that apparently skipped out on the mandatory media appearances on garbage bag day too, which is when they clean out their yeah. stores. And like, I think he was just angry at his usage and you know, that there's differences of opinions and sometimes you just need to make a trade and the flames it, discarding all the BS with personality issues this that and whatever the hearsay crap that gets circulated anytime a trade like this happens this was just a good hockey deal for both sides i'm really excited by this trade same here Uh, the flames got better for the long term and i think in the short term and carolina got better in terms of improving their number one defenseman and it allows them to make a couple trades with their group so it works for both sides and I think Calgary gets better for the future. I think Carolina gets better right now. Yeah. I'm well, not convinced the, the, you, that Fox you, will end up signing there either, but no, I don't either. Um, you look at their defense core and it's better than ours. So like in terms of the quality of depth of prospects, so I don't see Fox stay in there either, but, uh, you have to look, they had Svechnikov come in, uh, with their second overall pick. So they needed to get rid of a center and, well, and neither of these guys were ha- were happy there, according no. to reports. Their contracts were negotiations weren't going well, so I think this was just three guys who needed a change of scenery and Furland, which was, as you mentioned earlier, a prudent hockey move to make. Yeah, they sold high on him. Yeah. The interesting thing on this, though, is neither pl- neither player that the Flames brought in has a contract. They're restricted free agents right now. So the Flames get to sign these guys to contracts, and knowing the wizardry we've seen from Treliving, I think we could get some uh, some good contracts out of this. Any expectations or thoughts on what we might end up with for contracts for Lindholm and Hannafin? Uh, I'm hoping for like a seven-year deal at 4.75 for Lindholm. Uh, I think that's... He's probably shooting for that to start with a five, and I think the Flames are shooting for a four and a half. But... I somewhere in that range would be great uh for hannafin probably i think they're going to be trying to shoot for fewer years his camp but i'm hoping that the flames can sign a similarly long deal for like four and a half i think for lindholm just looking at other guys in the roster um i think you'll probably get closer to five but not quite five maybe 4.8 for five years for hannafin i think there he's probably gonna end up with a bridge deal i'm thinking about two and a half for two or three years yeah it might even be three and a half or something for three years whatever it takes them to like the year before his ufa i that could very well happen so we'll we'll see how things go but i think this is a great deal for the flames i think if anything if nothing else sorry it's um it's causing some excitement around here which we need yeah, and I think it's it's re-energizing the Flames fans. Well, the the Flames after last season they needed to shake things up. Yeah, uh, and you can't have a season like that. Like that's why I was saying about the coach. Like he had to go, and you also need to make players accountable. And whatever the personality issues, yada yada yada, you know something needed to be done. And Tre Living made the estimation that Hamilton. Furland and Fox were the ones that had to go, so that's what happened. And, you know, I'm looking forward to Hannafin and Lindholm putting on the Flaming Sea and seeing how they do. So where do you think these guys slot in the lineup, Matt? Uh, for me, I think, uh, well, the, the coaching staff's already said, like, Giordano's going to be with Brody, Hannafin with Hamannick. So Gio Brody will be pairing one, Hamannick, Hannafin will be the second pairing. Yeah, and Stone Kulak slash Anderson will be pairing three. Um, I could see Stone possibly getting traded, but as we'll it see. sits as it sits right now, I think it's going to be Stone Anderson for the third pair, and I think Kulak gets pushed back to number seven. That could very well be. Um, up front, I think what I'd personally like to see is Gaudreau, Monahan, Kachuk on line one. And you've mentioned that for a while, and just this yeah. week, the Flames head coach, Bill Peters, says he wants to try Kachuk as a right winger. Yeah, because you got to figure that Kachuk can carry a line by himself or be 
utilized uh, very effectively on a top line. Like, he's a dynamic forward. And he could probably be a 40, 50... Yeah, 35 to 40 goal scorer in the NHL. So if he's on the first line and he could get 70 points, like he's that caliber of a player. So, you know, putting him on the second line is not necessarily using him to his best. Anyhow, um, the second and third line left wingers will be, in my scenario, would be Bennett and Jankowski, whichever you way you want to slice it with the third line being whichever those two guys with Backlund and Froelich. And I'd have Lindholm as the second line center and get a right winger for the second line through free agency or trade. And the fourth line being miscellaneous parts and Brower. Interesting. Uh, so I had mine set up a little bit differently than you. I think the first line is going to be Goudreau, Monaghan, and right winger to be named later, whatever we can snag in free agency. We'll talk about who that might be later. Yeah, and that's one of those things that, as you're mentioning, like it depends on who we get. Like If we get James Neal, I think he gets first line right wing duties. We'll see. Like My it, issue you know, with putting Kachuk there is it puts all our eggs in one basket. I agree. I would do a second line of Kachuk, Backlund, Lindholm. I think Kachuk and Lindholm as the wingers and Backlund down the middle gives a lot of options for what that line can do. Yeah. And I think it gives Kachuk two really good setup guys that gives us a strong one-two line. Yeah. Uh, the thing I, I'm more concerned about is um, the utilization of Froelich in that scenario because Backlund the, and Froelich have such good chemistry both offensively and defensively that... Uh, you know, if you put them out on the second line or the third line, they're going to get their same amount of points. So having them separated from, like, everybody else, like, it helps to create depth throughout the lineup. Instead yeah, I, of, I would try both. I'd try Lindholm yeah. on two and three, but the reason I like Froelich on the third line is if you have Bennett Jankowski Froelich, I think that gives much more of a defensively responsible forward and Froelich on that line. Yeah, and a guy who might be able to do a little bit more of what Yager was supposed to do, which would be that veteran presence for the line. Yeah. Then on the fourth line, I originally had Shore penciled in as the center. We'll talk later, but he didn't get renewed. I have some theories on that. Um, I'm still putting Shore in as a potential center. Um, Brower and I'm going to say Klimchuk, some call up on the left, which gives you Lazar as your extra forward. Yeah, something like that. Well, that's why I said it's like spare parts and a Brower, just because there are like eight guys that could slot into those two spots. Would you try Brower agencies. on the Brower on the first line again? Well, we're just looking forward to the Brower play again. You know, we'll see what happens. We'll see if Ward, yeah. if Ward's going to go for that or not. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah, I don't know really with the fourth line because of the fact like. With the free agency opening, you also, at least for contract talks, like Derek Ryan, who played with Carolina, he's a free agent and a good fourth-line center. So I think with them not qualifying sure, they might be talking with Ryan on contract to see if, you know, because that would be an upgrade on shore. Although I'd actually kind of like to see both if possible like, and just, you know, get rid of Lazar at that rate but yeah well before we move on we have as we always do our weekly poll the poll for this week is what do you think about the flames hurricane trade and we want you to sound off on this you can do it on our website firesidechat.ca and our facebook page which is facebook.com slash fireside chat or on twitter at fireside podcast and we want to know what do you think of this trade do you think it's a good trade do you think it's a bad trade do we need time to to figure it out so let us know and we will uh go through those answers and see what the sea of red thinks uh later on in the summer matt before we get to the ufa season which is what you want to talk about that's what why everyone's here let's talk for the sake of completeness about two flames prospects coming in from europe and the flames have been pretty good about signing european prospects in the last little bit sometimes they work out sometimes they don't but they're giving them a try and especially when you don't have draft picks you gotta try them out so the Flames signed two guys here. I don't know if you know much about either. The first one is Yashin Elise, and he's 25. He's German, plays both wings, 
Shoots left, five foot ten, one eighty five. He played for the Nuremberg Ice Tigers in the DEL and got thirty one points. Anything you know about this guy? I do believe he played well during the Olympic Games, and I think that's what put him on the Flames' radar. It wasn't the the Nuremberg Ice Tigers David Wolf's old team? I don't know. I'd have to go look it up. Yeah. Anyhow, he's played uh, for the, the Ice Tigers since twenty thirteen. Yeah, so uh, I think that this will be a Stockton player. Uh, He's on a two-way. It makes sense. Yeah, and if he figures it out, then hey, great. But I don't see it being more than AHL depth. I mean, to me, there's the next Merrick Ribic, Daniel um, Preble. Preble. Yeah. They're all just AHL guys. Yep. Um, it's one of those, if they figure it out, hey, great, awesome, free, good player. David but Wolf played for doesn't... the Hamburg Freezers. Ah, there you go. Yep. So, and then the other guy that Flames brought in. I just I heard like cold related hockey teams. I'm like, hey, you the know. whole game's played in cold related temperatures, Matt. Yeah, I know, but not too many teams have like ice related names. So here we are talking about the team that has the, the freezers. Here we are talking so. about the Flames, the team that has the most opposite name to that. Mm-hmm. The next guy that they brought in was Marcus Hogstrom. He's 29 from Sweden. He's a six foot three defenseman, 203 pounds, shoots left. He's been playing in the SHL, the Swedish Hockey League, for, I don't even want to try and pronounce it, Dudge Gardens. Uh, been playing there for a number of years and got 23 points last year. Also played, I believe, in the Olympics. And, I don't know, Sweden didn't do all that well, but... Um, yeah. an older he guy. Was, uh, he was regarded as their best defenseman. So, at the very least, you're getting somebody competent. And to me, this guy just comes in to replace Cody Golubov as your veteran in in the A. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So if he pans out, hey, we've got a Bartkowski replacement. Yeah, I don't expect to either of them. I think if I want a Bartkowski no. replacement, there's other free agents I'd go shopping for. Almost like Matt Bartkowski, <laughs> but not quite. Yes. Does he have a twin brother, Mike Bartkowski? Yes. Almost the same, but different. Or Tam, you know, go the other way. Mirror Bartkowski, you know. There you go. Um, let's just go through some quick notes here before we get to UFA's time. This is from the season ticket holder meetings. I don't know if you went to the season ticket holder meetings this year, no. your season ticket holder, but they always let the fans ask questions of the GM and the hockey staff. So just some notes here. Treliving thinks that Rasmus Anderson is the most ready defenseman to push for an NHL job. I would agree. Uh, he thinks that Valimaki will turn pro and expected to start the season in the AHL. He's just a little bit behind Anderson. I think that's the best course of action for Valimaki. You know my thoughts on bringing the guy right to the NHL. I think putting him in the A and keeping him there till he's ready is the best idea, especially with the depth that we have in the defensive position of the NHL. Yeah, if there's an injury, I'm, I'd expect him to get a recall. But I'm thinking it'd be Shillington first. True. It depends on who's doing better at the time. I think sometimes if you recall a young guy too quickly, it screws them up a little bit because they're, they're playing yeah. above their head. Yeah. Um, he also said Klimchuk will push for a depth position out of camp. I think that's probably reasonable. Klimchuk's been around here long enough. Yeah, and he played well in the game that he played for Calgary. So, uh, it, if he plays, like, I, he might be a decent fourth-line player. Yeah, and, so. and really, if you look at the lineup, that's one of the positions we're going to have to fill, is a fourth-line forward. Yep. Um, Tree also said he thinks that Shin Carrick has been passed on the depth chart by Mangiapani, Hathaway, Lomberg, and Fu. He said this season may be Hunter's last shot because of his age. I think that's very reasonable, and we'll f we'll see later what happens to him when we talk about who gets qualified and who doesn't. But I think that Shin Carrick, I think he's right. This pro he was a highly touted prospect who never really came to be. I think this is the you know swimmer cut bait year for him. Yeah, and with Shin Carrick, he when he was drafted, he had attitude issues, and that's why he fell to Vancouver in the first place. And I think that like it's okay to have attitude issues if you're a guy like Patrick Kane who has the talent to back it up. But I don't think Shin Carrick did. And when you have that attitude, you're 
you tend to get in your own way in terms of not listening because you think you're just all that and then some. And I think that partly is what stunted him and like he hasn't really improved at all in since we had him. I guess my worry here too is if the Flames think that Shin Carrick is below uh, Lomberg and Hathaway on the depth chart, is there some worry about how we're assessing players? I know Hathaway played here. He kind of fell off a cliff. I'm not a huge fan of Lombergs. I think that there's still more, in my eyes anyways, there's still more in Shin Carrick than there is in a Lomberg or a Hathaway. Oh, it's also challenging Shin Carrick to be better. That's true. And, you know, piss him off. You know, because he needs a wake-up call. Like, you're getting passed by two guys that aren't that good, frankly. So, you know, step up. And if he does, great. If he doesn't, then you just cut bait and move on. Uh, Tree thinks Poirier can still be an NHL player. You know, I've been high on Poirier for a couple of years. He had a setback last year with some demons that he had. Um, but I think he's right. I think somebody, whether it's the Flames or someone else, Poirier will find a fourth-line role. Yeah, something like that. Or at least another AHL shot, and we'll see. There's a lot of talk as well about Bennett's status. As we know, Bennett is very polarizing for Flames fans. I'll just read one of the excerpts here I read from someone who went to the meeting. The last two exit interviews with Bennett have been two of the lengthiest. In last season's exit interview, Bennett was confident that if given a better role with more power play time, he'd perform better. Doesn't it sound like every hockey player? Yeah, gee, yeah. Give me more chances with good players and I'll be better. If you bring in Yager, I'll be better. Okay. Oh shit, they did it. Um, in this season's exit interview, Bennett owned things and said he needed to be better and didn't perform in a way that forced the coach's hand. Tree Living likes that Bennett is accountable to himself and realizes he needs to earn his spot in the lineup. The Flames yeah. still see Bennett as a top forward. Tree Living said one thing that cannot be debated about Bennett is his effort and his drive. Some players get you the playoffs, some players win you playoff games. Bennett is a guy you know will win you games. Considering how many times he's put us in the penalty box, I don't quite agree with that, but... Well, Bennett, he is a player who just needs to go off of instinct. And he... You can see when he's struggling, he's thinking too much on the ice of trying to make the perfect play, making the perfect pass. And then when things screw up, he tends to take dumb penalties, which causes <laughs> more problems and things snowball. And if he can get out of his own way, he'll find more success. It's just that it's not working because he's getting too frustrated with himself. So, and I think that, like, the penalties, it's from frustration more than lack of discipline. And at some point, though, that's the coach's uh, responsibility to say, hey, you're, you know, getting in your own head. Let's sit you down for a bit, calm you back down, and then put you on the ice. Uh -huh. And so I'm hoping that a new coaching staff will be able to do that a bit more. I'm not ready to give up on this kid. I think no, no. I think he. I think he'll still be a 60 point player, and a top two line player, and a very good player. It's just that he needs to develop. And some players are quick to get there, like Monahan or Kachuk. Others take time, and I think Bennett's one of those that will take his time getting there, but will get there. Because you can see the flash is a skill with him. It's not like he the skill game went entirely away and he's just like Nail Yakupov who's like basically crap. It, it, there's still the skill there. You know, it's... And this is why you're not a scout. Your report would say basically crap. <laughs> it's very complimentary. <laughs> You'd have to look up the word crap in Google Translate in Russian and put that in your report. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that there's still some to Bennett. I think Bennett needs to figure out that sort of hockey sense and awareness. So he's not taking those penalties. And I think the coaching staff needs to not be afraid to sit him down or reduce his minutes when he is getting frustrated. Well, and then the last note from those meetings was that all players are now healthy, which is good to hear. So everyone that had something going on, we know Kachuk had his concussion, Brody, Monahan, they're all healthy and ready to go. Which is good. Especially this early in the summer. Give them time to get ready for next year. Well, Matt, with that, are you ready to talk about free agents? Yep. 
So let's start with just a number here before we get into free agency. I feel like we need some sort of music for like talking about free agency. But as we know, the salary cap goes up next year. The 2018-2019 cap will be $80 million, uh, 79.5. The Flames have $55 million committed right now to 13 players, which is one goalie, four defensemen, eight forwards. They still need to sign the two guys we talked about earlier. But they, at this point, as far as my calculations go, we got twenty four point five million to play with. Yeah. So. Well, I think uh, most of that will be uh, like cheaper contracts. Like I think uh, you're gonna have like nine ish million for the two players we just acquired, which will leave like f- just short of fifteen million for everybody else. So. Well, yeah, you know, like th- th- there's a lot, you know, and most of the players like are going to be like fourth line guys. So like there's only going to be one top six forward likely to be acquired and like that guy will probably be in the five, six range as well. And yeah, so well, it's more talk- than affordable. Before we talk about who's coming in, why don't we talk quickly about who's not coming back? Sure. So today was RFA deadline. For those that uh, know the difference between free agency, RFA means the team restricted free agent. The team retains their rights. They might not be signed here, but no one else can sign them without offer sheeting, which nobody does because then there's a draft pick implication. Anyway, uh, John Gillies, Noah Hannafin, um, Hathaway, Garnet Hathaway, Mark Jankowski, Morgan Klimchuk, Brett Kulak, Elias Lindholm, David Riddick, and Hunter Shankarik were all qualified. So the team holds on to their rights. On the other side, Austin Carroll, Emil Poirier, Dan Pribble, Nick Shore, and Hunter Smith were not qualified. As well, the team has announced that Olus Matson will not be signed prior to what was a June 1st deadline because he was on an AHL contract. Sure Living has said they're going to offer him a contract, but it would probably be an AHL one. So, Matt, of those lists of guys staying or going, anyone shock you? I'm frankly shocked that they kept Shin Carrick and let go of Poirier and Nick Shore. I think that, uh, like, if you're going to keep Shin Carrick, keep Poirier. Um, and Nick Shore, I think the only reason why is that they wanted to avoid arbitration and that you'll probably see him sign tomorrow or something like that. Yeah, so Shore was entitled to a one way qualifying offer of 971000 so let's just round up to a million. I think for a fourth line center, you don't want to pay him a million bucks. I think you're totally right. They let Nick go, and I think he'll be back at like six hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, something like that. Like they'll f- uh, deal with it. Like even if it's eight hundred thousand or whatever. Um, I agree with you about Poirier. I'm surprised that Poirier is leaving, but at the same time, I don't rule him out in the Flames organization. I can see them turn around offering him a Stockton contract. I think yeah. that needing a couple of years to bounce back, he might not be a prudent um, use of a contract right now. And I don't think there's other teams that are going to be jumping to get him either. No, because he hasn't really stood out very much. Neither is Shin Carrick. That's why, I, frankly, I was shocked that they kept him too. But but again, as they mentioned earlier, Tree said, I think they're looking at it as they're giving him one more year. Yep. Aside from those, we also have Chris Stewart, Matt Stajan, Chris Versteeg, Matt Bartkowski, Merrick Rivick, Dalton Prout, and Tanner Glass, who are all leaving as UFAs. I don't see any of those guys getting no, re-signed. not a one. So with that, let's get into UFA signing. This is what everyone's excited about. July 1st, UFA signing opens. Uh, Matt, before we talk actual players, what kind of player, what role on this team do you think the team's looking for? I think that they're looking for a good fourth line center. And I think that it'll either be Nick Shore or Derek Ryan. And because of Ryan's familiarity with Peters and all that. And, and you know, I, I could see that either, you know, because they're both good face off guys. So, and I think that's the most important thing that you want from your fourth line center is somebody to win the face offs. And that's why Lindholm is so valuable as a center. Uh, especially on his strong side, because he wins like 56% of his face-offs or something like that. So uh, I would imagine that that will be addressed through free agency, whether it's re-signing Shore or getting a guy like Ryan. So you mentioned Derek Ryan. For those that don't know, he's a 31-year-old, five foot 11, 170-pounder from uh, currently playing in Carolina. He's played here in the University of Alberta in his college years, and then he's never really stuck at the NHL level. He played six games in 2015, 2016, 67 games in 2016, 2017, and also 
played in the AHL both years, and then last year was his first full year where he played 80 games and got 38 points. I think he'd be a solid number four. I just worry how much we'd have to pay him to be a number four. Yeah, like I, it, I don't think it'd be more than a million and a quarter, million and a half. So, I'd be okay with that. Yeah, and and as a thirty-one-year-old piece, I mean, sign him to a one-year and hope one of the kids takes him out next year. Yep. And the other thing they need is a top six forward. Period. Doesn't matter what position. Who are you thinking? If I had to guess, uh, I would say James Van Riemsdyk. I was going to say, don't tell me Tavares. Target. No. Well, they could, but really, no. I think Tavares he's is going back to making the, ten million the, for eight, over eight years. Yeah, I, he's going back to New York, so I don't see him going to Toronto or anywhere else. As long as he stays out in the East, I really couldn't care less where he goes. <laughs> frankly, so, so you're thinking James Van Riemsdyk or who else? Uh, that would be my number one choice just because of his age. He's a little on the younger side of 29. the various options. Yeah. So like he's young enough where if you had him for four years, like he's still youngish, you know, not like 36, 37. Uh, James Neal might be an option, but I don't. I wouldn't be a fan of it because I really don't like James Neal. If at I all. was going to do Van Riemsdyk, who I think would be a great option as potentially a first line right winger, even, I'd do probably three years at no more than five and a half. I'd be fine with 424 uh, at the upper end for a player like that. Um, what about, same with Neal. What about uh, David Perron? That'd be like if you didn't get. Neil or Van Riemsdyk and you're into bargain hunter mode because you need somebody I don't think Perron's a very good player at all and so like he can score but the whole of his game he just leaves me like you should be better than this and he always has ever since St. Louis it just there's always been something weird about him where He's always a good scorer, but there's just nothing else to his game, and it's quite annoying. I, I Plus, re- I hate his visor. I it's really, really like annoying. Neil. <laughs> I think Neil would be a great first line pickup. Um, yeah, but I think that he's one of the few, let's call them elite forwards out there, and I don't think we're going to want to pay the cost it's going to take. Yeah, he's probably looking at something that starts with a seven. So, and I, I just, yeah, no, that that's too much. You know, because I could see some team throwing a four-year, thirty million at him, and I just I don't see that being appropriate for him. No, I agree. I think you could. I think you could probably have Neil at about four and a half per year, and I could even see the Flames doing a short one or two-year deal on Neil at say four and a half. Yeah, I don't see him taking that though. Uh, I think that because of the cap going up, the teams have more cap space. So like six and a half, seven. Yeah. Probably more. <laughs> um, well, well you, you saw John Carlson getting signed an eight, eight deal. Like, yeah, but Carlson he, also just won the cup. Of, like there's a, I know a couple of years ago, that would have been a 6 million per. So, yeah. And I think, but I think at the same time, if you look at Evander Kane getting seven for seven, yeah, I know. You know, I mean, Which, that's, that's a bad contract, but anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as other... Hey, you were good for a month. Here's a, you know, more money that you, than you know what to do well, with. Well, I think, too, if you look <laughs> up what San Jose gave away for him, they kind of had to make that deal. Oh, yeah, of course they did. But, yeah, that's going to be like Milan Lucic 2.0. I think you're right. I think either Van Riemsdyk or Neil... Our guys, the Flames have to target heavily if we want to. If we're looking to get a top line winger, like let's yeah, say like it, it's one of those things you can pussyfoot around with guys like Versteeg and Yager, where like if everything goes fine, they will do well enough where you're okay. But after the season that they had, they need to get out of the ifs and maybes and get guaranteed this guy is good. Mm-hmm and will perform and you know they just need to get somebody like that it doesn't really matter who it is or what position they play because of the fact that the flames have so many versatile players now 
that you can swap everybody around. Like, they have four dynamite centers right now, like, and they can all play on the wing as well. So, like, you know, it's... Not a guy I'd necessarily see as a top six here, but I would really like the Flames to go out and try to get Michael Grabner. I think he's quick. He's going to bring some scoring to the lineup, and I think he brings that veteran presence they hoped a guy like Versteeg would bring. If they didn't have the depth that they do, like, if, say, Sam Bennett wasn't there, then I'd agree, but there's just not enough roster spots really like unless you just like throw lazar into the sun and give him the fourth line spot like that's about all you could do with a guy like grabner okay so here's my prediction is i think if the flames end up getting a guy like grabner it makes a guy like fro leak expendable who is coming near the end of his contract anyways and i could yeah, see the fl- I, agree. I could see the flames i mean at 4.3 million I could see the Flames trying to then move the Frolic deal to put Grabner in. Yeah, it it's one of those things where if you could get the right situation, you could trade Frolic and Stone together to get somebody who's slightly overpaid but is a better player or than either. Or pick out some higher draft picks. We could use some of those. Well, if you look, like there are a number of players like that say are like on a six and a half million dollar contract that are worth like five million where if you traded those two guys for that player you'd be net increasing your overall ability but the only downside there is you're trading almost seven millions so if you're looking at a team that wants to shed cap space yeah but the two positions versus one yeah so but usually those guys that they want to give up they're trying to shed cap space in that kind of scenario yeah um, let me throw out a couple other names. Like I said, I would go for Grabner. I think I'd rather sign more guys than we have spots for and figure it out later than say we don't have spots, let's not sign them. Yeah. Another guy like that that I really like is Tobias Ryder. Or Reader. I I wouldn't mind him either. He's and I wouldn't also mind Anthony Duclair, who for some reason didn't get qualified. Yeah, I think Duclair but, would be good. I could also see if the Flames are looking for a thirteenth forward, bringing Devontae Smith Pelly in. Yeah, same here. I think he's what they were looking for in Chris Stewart and didn't get. A guy who can play a lot of positions, a guy who's been around the league for a while, obviously just won a cup. I wouldn't necessarily want to put him in the lineup all the time, but I think he could be a good... I I honestly think that DSP will get paid, unfortunately. I think he will too. I mean, he didn't get qualified. I'm thinking like, I think he's going to get like a $3 million, just like Fernando Pisani when he had his run that one year for the Oilers and then did nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, an- or Bickle. <laughs> another guy, or two other guys I can see the Flames bringing in if they're looking for that veteran depth guy is either Tommy Wingles or pot- yeah. or potentially Drew Stafford. Yeah. Um, that If that's what they walked away with, you'd be like, eh, your free agency day sucked. But, you know, if they get somebody and those kind of guys, then hey, great, awesome. I don't think we're going to do any shopping on the blue line. What about you? Uh, the only conceivable way they would is if they're just signing a number seven guy. And I don't even know why you would. Unless they trade off Stone, then maybe they'd get a veteran. I think if you're trading Stone, seven. though, you don't go out and trade Stone and bring in a vet. I think you trade Stone to make room for a kid. Oh, yeah. You, I would make the vet guy the number seven, like a Barkowski replacement, and have like Anderson Kulak be the 5'6". Yeah, looking at the guys that are out there that I'd want in that role, I mean, the only guy looking at the list that I can see would be a guy like Luke Shen. And even yeah, then, I'd rather, here, I'd rather go yeah. with... Uh, every, I mean, defensemen yeah, always get paid more on the yeah, trader no. market. Yeah. And I'm not sure I want Luke Shen here. Yeah, and goalie front internally, Riddick or Gillies gets the job. Who cares? Well, actually, this is what I want to talk to you about. So the Flames have a tendency to go with veteran goaltenders. I've been looking it up. Like we, we... I know, and they need to stop doing that. They got two goalies that are NHL caliber. Let them figure it out. <laughs> I can see the Flames inviting a couple goaltenders to camp and, oh, yeah. and having them push the kids. Um, but also knowing where Peters is from and stuff like that, do you think it's out of the realm possibility of Flames throw something to Cam Ward? I think that Cam Ward will go to Dallas for some reason. I have no idea why. All right. It just sticks in my head that he'll be a Dallas star. I originally wanted Carter Hutton here, but I think he's the best of this class, and he will 
probably get paid quite well. Yeah, and like if you look at the other options like Mrazek or Leonard, like they're gonna get paid like three ish mm -hmm. plus and really But looking at the other Riddick and Gillies did well enough and like they need time in the NHL. I just have a funny see... feeling the Flames are gonna bring in a veteran. Yeah, I, I do too, and I really don't want them to. So the names <laughs> you talked about off the board let me go through some names here of what I think are the best goalies available and give me your thoughts on them, okay? Okay. Uh, Kerry Lettinen. Yeah, uh, pass. I think pass. I think for a backup, he might not be a bad choice. Pass. Uh, Yaroslav Halak. <laughs> He'd be okay. Uh, I don't mind Halak. Jonathan Bernier. Pass. Why? He's good for, like, one game, and then, like, he'll be crap for, like, eight others. So, just pass. Uh, Andrew Hammond. No, I don't want the Hamburglar here. He's a guy who had one or two good years and no one heard from him uh, again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about Andre Pavlik? Pass. Uh, both Lettinen and Pavlik are like six years past their prime, so go with somebody else. <laughs> and what about Michael Hutchinson? Eh, uh, it... It'd be like signing McElhinney. It's like, oh, gee, exciting. You know, like, not really. The other name that's getting thrown around is apparently Craig Anderson wants out of Ottawa, and I'm thinking, you know, I really don't want to add a 41-year-old backup. Yeah. I mean, depending on how cheap we... I, I wouldn't mind necessarily, but he has a contract, if I recall correctly, that's not too nice, so I wouldn't want to bother. Like, there are other teams that could use him. I think if you could get him for the right price, and as you mentioned, you could get um, you could get enough of his contract swallowed. He's on a four point seven five million dollar deal. He could be an okay backup because he clear waivers no problem for the AHL. A veteran guy down there. Yeah, uh, let Ottawa eat that. You know, <laughs> like let's not do them any favors. Um, so, I mean, really, and, oh, and then we could always go back to Eddie Lack or Chad Johnson. Those are the other names on the oh, list. Oh, gee. Yay. I just, I don't know. I agree with you that we need to let one of the young guys do it, but I just have this funny feeling that the Flames might end up signing a veteran backup. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if they did. It's just, I don't want them to. What like, I could. You got it. Like, you look at Winnipeg, like the, uh, Hellebuck, they let him... Like, he sucked for, like, two years when he first got into the NHL, uh, primarily as the backup, and then, like, he waffled a bit. And then this year, he was the runner-up for the Vesna. And I'm not saying that Gillies is that good or Riddick is that good, but they need time to see what they are mm -hmm. at the NHL level. And, like, they might have bad games, but if they figure it out, then you have your long-term goalie in place and you can't get them that experience at the ahl level they have to play in the nhl so uh, they need to get that done what i could see the flames doing is going and getting a guy like michael leaton dustin tokarski anders Lindback, and assigning them to the ahl and pretty much using them as the backup for either Gilly, yeah, I could see gillies that. riddick or parsons whoever's down there to help push that position yep even like a Maxime Legacy who was in Vegas, 25 years old, I could see if you can get him for less than a million. I mean, if you lose him on waivers, you lose him on waivers, but I think it would be a worthwhile investment, especially a guy like Leighton who's been around for a while. Yep. Um, so overall, I don't think the Flames are going to do much shopping. And I could actually see them, instead of going out and signing a free agent, I could see them trying to go out and acquire the rights this week to an RFA instead. Someone like a Mark Stone or uh, Jason Zucker or s somebody like that instead of trying to play on the free agent market. Yeah, I think that the Flames would make trades in that, and I wouldn't want to give up what we'd need to, frankly. So I just I think it'd just be better to bite the bullet and pay the extra million dollars or so for the UFA than go the RFA route. Oh, and your favorite NHL player, uh, Nail Yakupov, didn't get qualified, so we could go after him too. Shocking! Twenty. Shocking! That is the most surprising news I have ever heard. <laughs> Do you think he'll go back to Russia? Oh, guaranteed. Like he needs to just go away. 
and hope that like playing in the KHL for like four years might he might sort something. What's the so farm to get a league contract. for the KHL? Is it the VHL or something? Yeah. See, the one guy on the RFA list I would like the Flames to acquire, but like you said, the price won't be worth it, is Jake Vertanen. Yeah. I don't want to give up what Vancouver would want, but I like the player. Yeah. Well, like, I wouldn't even be opposed if the Flames went after, like, targeted some younger guys like, say, Thomas Yurko or... Um, Yurko's 20. Anthony DeClaire. Yeah, Yurko's you know, 25. Like, they're younger. Yeah, but, like, they're NHL caliber players and, like, just invite them to camp or sign them to two A deals or something. Well, Yurko's like an that. RFA, so you couldn't bring him in. Uh, they're, uh, they weren't qualified. Oh, okay. So they're UFAs now. The other thing I could see, and we don't really know a lot about Nylander and if he wants to stay in Vegas, but if he doesn't. I think he'd be expensive, but it might be worth looking to put together a package for William ne- or in Toronto. Sorry, um, I think that it might be worth. I can see Vegas going after him, but I can also see Calgary going after William Nylander. Yeah, I think that ship sailed when we traded Hamilton. Frankly, I could see doing a Brody and a goalie for Nylander. Yeah, well, if that was the case, then they, the Flames would definitely need to sign a defenseman. But and then they need to bring in a backup goalie. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Yep. They still have one, but the circle yeah, I is think, complete. And I think, <laughs> and I think that you know, we, you and I talked a lot about Brody being traded last year. I think it made more sense when he was a second pairing guy. Now, if Brody's going to be your number one guy with Geo, you can't trade him. No, and but at least not right now until he rebuilds his value because he had a really shit season being on the second line and. Uh, Hopefully he can bounce back. And if I look at the available UFA uh, defenseman, there's none that I would say, yeah, let's replace him with that. Like the best guy out there is Mike Green, and he's going to get paid. Yeah, and he's not very good. No, but I mean, somebody always ends up paying him more than he's worth. I don't know how oh, he yeah. does it. Well, I know. Well, hey, he can score, so he's clearly awesome. Thomas Hickey, I think, is going to be paid more than he's worth. Yeah, pretty much everybody that's a defenseman because teams need defense. And I, I honestly think look at like they, Andrew McDonald, what he got paid by Philadelphia all those years ago. It's like, um, why? <laughs> you know, you're talking about a number seven defenseman. I'm just looking at the list here. I wouldn't be opposed to bringing in a Johnny Oduya for that role. Yeah, he can mentor Shillington, or even like an Andre Schuster if we could get him cheap enough. Yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, we've seen the Flames make some bad decisions on July 1st. Let's look at a guy like Troy Brower, for example. I think the Flames will probably put in some some bids on those top guys and then probably back off and wait and see what the market does. Yeah, I think they need to go out and sign one of the top guys. And then if not, then figure out how to get one, period. They need another top six forward. It doesn't matter who. Yeah, and I think you're right. If you can't sign one, then you've got to make a trade to get one. But I'd be, I'm would be, i more comfortable going into the season with Lindholm in the top six, but I still, and I think we could probably do something there, but I'd be much more comfortable with another, let's say, yeah, top same three here. forward. Yeah. Well, as long as they are a legitimate like 40, 50 point guy, and like not like, hey, you played on the top line with some all stars and you got forty points like Furland. You need like a legit guy who can create offense on his own. Yeah. As long as you get somebody like that and throw him in the top six, you're good. Well, I think like I said earlier, even a guy like Grabner is probably good for at least thirty. If you can put him as a depth guy, he picks up some of the slack for someone who might be having a bad year. Yeah. They just need somebody, period. And and if we're talking about making a trade, I mean, again, Froley could be a tradable asset there as well. Yeah, he's the exactly. he's the only forward I look at and say he could be easily expendable with the right UFA pickup. Yep. Well, Matt, that's uh, that's our preview of July first. We'll see what happens there. That's always a big day for Flames fans. Are you going to sit and watch a whole day of coverage on TSN or Sportsnet? No, I actually have work to do. So, I'm always surprised when people say I'm going to be painting those days. You can listen, you know. There's nothing more exciting than painting iron pots in the garage. There you go. Are you at least Yay. painting them flames colors? No, black. Okay. 
So. Well, that's a flames color. Well, that is a flames color. Yeah. So I guess partially. So um, we will be back for another show probably about the 10th of July. The Flames Rookie Development Camp takes place July 4th to 8th at Windsport. You'll be able, which is at COP. You'll be able to get more details soon on the Flames website. But as always, Matt and I are there. We would love to meet you. Come say hi to us if you see us. We'll be covering that. And we will be doing, as we usually do, interviewing some prospects, putting together a show uh, each day, which we'll just make into one big show. And that's where we'll also cover whatever happens July 1st. So uh, our next show will be about mid-July, which I don't know about you. It's always a weird event for me when we're sitting in an arena wearing shorts talking hockey. Well, I actually dress properly, Dan. <laughs> Matt, Matt wears zip-off pants so he can change them into shorts. Oh, yes. Um, Classy. And then last thing is I want to remind people that we have our listener survey going on. You can take this at www.firesidechat.ca slash survey. The listener survey is your chance to tell us what you think about the show, what's going on, what you like about the show, what you would like us to improve on. And it helps us shape next season and the kind of content that we're going to put into the show. Also, because we want your feedback, it only takes like 10 minutes, but if you enter your name and email address at the bottom, which is completely optional, we will be doing a draw of everyone that enters in August and giving out a prize pack. And that's some Flames merchandise, some Fireside Chat stuff. So it's a neat little reward for someone who does it. So fill it out if you want to help us out uh, and you want to enter for the prize, put in your name and email, otherwise sent to us totally anonymously. So uh, we hope you'll do that. Again, that's firesidechat.ca slash survey. So Matt, that's uh, all we have for today. We had a lot of Flames news. We will talk to you July 4th when I see you at COP. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.